Hello, let's, um, let's return to the surge for a little bit. Surge, yeah. Uh, it's a happier topic, perhaps, uh, because I think your piece, I remember reading your piece, I guess it was in early 2010, Kandahar, um, and it was really the first independent journalist and somebody who'd spent more than a decade in Afghanistan saying, hey, the surge is working, the Taliban are being pushed out of Panjwai and other parts, and to me it seemed, in fact, I even remember, I think shortly after talking to David Petraeus, and he was saying, you know, the fact that Carlotta has written this is, you know, it was really indicative that the surge really worked. So I guess the question is, um, you know, to what it, you kind of indicated this a little bit, but how would you, let's do the thought experiment where President Obama had not ordered the surge. What would be, what would be looking at right now? We, we might have lost, well, not we, but they might have lost Kandahar. I think that's, that's always been what the Taliban wanted to do. They wanted to take it in 2006. I think in, by 2010, they were very close. And I, I showed they were, they were in Mahalajat, which is really an outlying area of Kandahar. And they'd, they'd sent in these huge truck bombs. Um, they, and, and all the people were saying they're ready to, to do a run on the outlying police stations and therefore they would have had, they would have got control of a district of a city. And, and then, um, you know, Afghans are, are, are very clever in sensing the shift of power. And so if there was a shift of power, they, they, they would have already been reaching out, in fact, to the Taliban. And so I think you could have seen the Taliban retake the city or, or um, certainly control And I think Gen General McChrystal's assessment uh, before the surge was that, and that, you know, written by people like Fred Kagan and Kim Kagan, was that effectively, by sort of stealth, they were beginning to take over Kandahar City anyway, right? From yeah, I mean, they were in the streets. People yeah. said, we, you, we see people who we know are Taliban, they're walking in the streets. So, uh, I mean, I, whether they would, you know, then you, you've got the big Kandahar Air Base, so, so what does that mean? You, you, you try and think, well, what would have happened there? Would they have been fighting in the streets? But I think they could have taken the city, um, and that would have shown, you know, they, everyone says if you control Kandahar, you control the country. It's perhaps an exaggeration, but I think they would have been able to sh create a shift in people's minds that, yes, the Taliban is back and we have to work with them. Um, and, and then the Afghans, you know, really would have, I think, turned against the foreigners. And I think that could have been a fundamental moment. And I think McChrystal was right in his assessment that if we don't stem it now, it will be unstoppable. Um, you know, during the Vietnam War, it was kind of a common view at a certain point that if you, if you took away the Cambodia safe haven, all problems would be kind of resolved, right? That that was the issue, and then we started a bombing campaign in Cambodia. I mean, is it a little bit too simple of an explanation to say the problems are in Afghanistan are caused by Pakistan, particularly when the Taliban themselves, as you know, were completely indigenous Afghan movement that were later, you know, at that time, Pakistan was backing Gulbuddin Hekmatyar in 94 when they took right. over Kandahar, right. and then they kind of switched horses. So, yeah. um, you know, I'm suspicious of explanations that sort of say, well, this is the one explanation that explains everything. Yeah, but I, I don't believe the Taliban, when, when they did come up, would have grown and expanded so far without Pakistan's backing. Yeah. And I try and show that. Um, but I think um, going back to now, I think they could not have, uh, have done so much without Pakistan because, yes, they're Afghans and a, a lot of young men joined them to fight. But without the money, without the, the sense that th there's a bigger power, there's, it's the inevitability of power that makes people join them. So Afghans joined them out, out of a calculation. Th you know, in 2006, they thought, oh, they're back, we'll join them. Uh, when the surge came, everyone shifted uh, How does against this square them. with the fact that uh, more Pakistani soldiers have died fighting the Taliban than US and NATO soldiers combined? I'm not sure if I trust those figures, actually. Well, let's assume um, that they're more or less in the ballpark. Certainly thousands of Pakistani soldiers have died fighting the Taliban. Yeah, yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. And I think, I think that's why I think they're running a ruinous campaign. They're risking their own people's lives um, by playing a double game. What they're trying to do is, is control and use the Taliban, project them across the border. 
But some of them, and, and some of them they've tried to control through very bad treatment in their own prisons, you know, torture of their own former uh, militant proxies. Yeah, their former assets. And so those guys have turned against them. Ilyas Kashmiri, he was tortured in a Pakistani prison. That's why he's so angry and fighting against Pakistan. So, so, and he was tortured with his father in the same room. They were both tortured. So he's mad as anything. You know, so that's why they've got this backlash. Um, so it is confusing, but, but um, I, think, I think they're doing both. But I think they're... I think the military, Pakistani military, has got on a, on a, a, a mission where they've lost themselves. They're, they're trying to do two things which they think can st they can still work. And they've lost their way because they're just in this appalling mess where their own soldiers are dying, and yet uh, they're also killing Afghans. Um, and they're hated now in the Pakistani tribal areas, the Pakistani military. And it's a reign of fear. I went to SWAT, and no one dared talk to me. I was with the military, and no one dared talk to me. And I could just feel when the, was that? the fear was palpable. It was at the time of the floods. So when was that? 2008. Because there was a time when, Pakistan, when, the, when the Taliban took over SWAT in 2009. My wife was with um, there, and you know, the Pakistani military came in. They were greeted as an army of liberation. Right. Well, I w well, then the floods happened, and actually they were, they were terrific in, in helping people with the floods because the floods d devastated SWAT. But, but I went up with them on a, f on a flood relief flight, and people were too scared to talk. And they were all terrified, I could tell, of the military. So something that they were, they were rescued from the Taliban, but then they were running a very nasty... I think very strong repression. Do you of think the, the Pakistani population? military will do an operation in North Waziristan? That's, that's a great. I've been talking about that for years, wondering if they're going to do it. Uh, we Is saw it more likely now? Uh, it, w it looked like it was for a few weeks, not long ago, but I, I think now it's not going to happen. Is it your impression the military are more in favor than the civilian political leadership? I don't Pakistan? trust that, no. I think, uh, I, I know Nawaz Sharif quite well, and I know he does believe in pulling back um, control of security policy from the military. He believes the civilian government must control um, all and foreign policy, and he believes that the military has to be brought under stronger control but on and the, the issue other side. But on the issue of going into North Waziristan? I think, um, I think he thinks it can, can be done a better way. So I think he's, he, and he said this, and, and Chowdhury Nisar, his interior minister, has said this, that they, they believe in fighting the Taliban, but they believe there's a better way of doing it. So I think what they mean is less double dealing. And do, you less think, do you think the peace negotiations are a way of preparing public opinion for when they yes. collapse and then they'll do the operation? Yes, I think, I think all governments, we saw the PPP government did that as well, the ANP government. You have to tell Pashtuns that there isn't a peaceful option before showing, showing moving in force because that, that's the way they, they would only accept it. One of your former colleagues, Dexter, uh, Dexter Filkins, wrote a long piece in the New Yorker a couple of years back, maybe a year back, predicting an, an Afghan civil war. And we both yeah. admired Dexter as a reporter. Mm. Now the civil war just, in fact, instead of a civil war, there seems to be a, a you know, sort of a civics love fest going on where ethnic groups are coalescing around single tickets. Um, people are voting across ethnic lines. There's been higher turnout. In, the last time there was a 60% turnout election in the United States was in 1968. That's right. Um, so yes. we're seeing, were you surprised by how well these elections went or you, you thought? Well, I was just in Kabul before the election and yeah. I felt it, you could feel it. it yeah. was ver it's very exciting. Afghans really, despite the violence, they were just determined and they're very motivated because now after 12 years of Karzai, there's a new leader. So they yeah. were actually very excited to, to discuss and, and, and families were discussing among themselves. There were debates on TV. So that, that there's an enthusiasm for democracy and for choosing a new leader. But actually, I think the second round, which should probably go to second round, we might see the divisions of the ethnic groups come out more. Because if it's Abdullah against Ashraf Ghani, you'll probably see the Pashtuns coalesce around the Pashtun leader and, and the northerners, you know, well, the, the Tajiks and the Hazaras coalesce around Abdullah. So you might see a bigger division. Do you think there's a disconnect between people who are actually spend a lot of time in Afghanistan who basically had the view that this was going to go... Pr I mean, when you ask the average, even well-educated American about Afghanistan, they tend to have a sort of a view that it's sort of like Iraq. 
which and so they oppose, impose an Iraq frame on it. Um, you know, is the media responsible for not, in a sense, making clear that there are very, very big differences? Or, I mean, media obviously, we're, we're, we're doing bad news stories. We don't report on hurricanes that don't happen. We report on hurricanes that do happen. So by its nature, it's biased towards bad news. And I don't want to sound like Donald Rumsfeld here, who's you know, always complaining about the lack of good news out of Iraq. But the point is, is that why do so many, uh, this is the most unpopular war in American history. 82% of Americans have an unfavorable view of, Vi of Afghanistan, more than Vietnam. It, why is more, more unpopular in history, would you say? It's the most unpopular most war unpopular now Bush. in American history. CNN polled in January. So why is that? Because I we know that there's a lot of good things going on. Right, but I think it's because the perception is we're losing. And I, it, 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 you know, right from the beginning, it was the good war. It was the war that people believed in and, and, and saw the reason for it because it was so directly connected to 9-11. And then I think it started to, I think things changed. Now, I don't live here. I live there. So I'm, you, you, you're, you can correct me on American thinking, but it seemed to me that all the, the disillusion set in when the war was going bad. The same with the disillusion with Karzai started when the war started going bad. And there's a feeling that the surge didn't work, whereas I saw on the ground, certainly in Kandahar and the south of Afghanistan, it did work. Um, and, you know, now you have the longer period where you've, you've got to consolidate those gains, and that's where things can slip. You, you spent a lot of time with Karzai. When he came into power, he was like the second coming of, you know, uh, the, he was the greatest person in the world. And suddenly, in, he, in Washington, he's the worst person in the world. Neither, the, both of these views cannot be accurate. So what, tell me about his motivations. And do you think it's a good thing that he's not signing the BSA? Because who, it, basically, a president with a mandate will now be signing it, will have more legitimacy. Well, I, lo I love the fact that one of his aides just came up saying he might sign it after all. <laughs> no. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he wants to. Maybe on know, August 31st, 2014. Yes, suddenly say, I want my name on that document. Um, I think Karzai, I try and show, he's a brilliant politician. He's, he's, you know, he's been spending his whole time working to keep on top, you know, manipulating everyone else, um, managing the relationship and so on. But I do show that um, you know, you make an enemy of an Afghan and they never will forgive you. So Is that like Ambrian Hol Holbrook's fault? Yes, and it was also Karzai's own fault for f doing the massive fraud and, and, and then getting angry when it, he got caught out. So I, mean, I right. think it was a accumulation of that big mess. But yes, he, and he, but what he does feel is that he felt betrayed. He felt that the Americans wanted him out. I think and I he had a reason, good reason to think of It seems that they, yeah, you know, it seems that Holbrook thought Ashraf Ghani could win, um, which I never thought. But, and Icombreeze did start you know, entertaining the opposition. And so Karzai just saw that as absolute betrayal. And, and then he was, you know, humiliated to admit that he hadn't won the election and go to a second round. And that, when I saw his face that day, I thought, ooh, he's never going to forgive anyone who's put him through this. Because that was humiliation. And, and Afghans don't, don't take that lightly. So I, I felt, you know, the West handled him incredibly badly. You know, I'm, I see all his warts as well. But I do think he's been made a scapegoat these last 25 years. years from now. Will he be seen as sort of the Afghan Lincoln, or will he be seen as the Afghan Nixon, or what, would he, what will he be seen as? I, I don't think he's great. But you know, when you ask Afghans, um, the Karzai years are going to be seen as this great moment of, of In fact, polling shows that he's consistently popular. We've had multiple, you know, multiple years of polling. He always looks does 60 percent. I think is usually the average. Yeah, and 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 Pashtuns particularly you know, are upset with him and weary of him and blame him for, you know, this whole insurgency or for not. But, but given if he was running, they would still vote for him. I mean, they will. So, you know, they might criticize him, but still um, they would vote for him over. Could he run again a cup, uh, 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 for a third term, which is not associated some with his two terms? Some I think say he's got that in mind. That he and constitutionally, it would be possible. He could come back for a third term, say, say in 10 years. I'd I mean, he'll only really be 66. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I thought it was just two terms. But uh, some people say that that's what he's got in mind. He wants to do a Medvedev Putin changeover. Yeah. So but we'll he, didn't, see. he didn't endorse any candidates. No. And his preferred candidate is doing terribly. Yeah. But, but some people say he's been supporting both Ashraf Ghani and Zalmay Rasul. So he's kept a foot in both camps. Um, 
Okay. In fact, he's cleverer than that. I think he's he's got relations with all the candidates. Yeah. Except Abdullah and he are not buddies. No, but I think he's. I think there's been a bit of a reaching out <laughs> in case, okay, you know? Right. It seems there's yeah. quite a lot of reaching out will need to be done for that one to work. <laughs> um, so turning to bin Laden. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, there are three levels of um, assertions in the book. Start, let's start with the ones that seem the most reasonable from my point of view. The correspondence with Mullah Omar and the leader of LET. Um, now, you can sort of, uh, that, that seems entirely plausible. Those documents have not come out publicly, but there's certainly been discussion of those, of those kind of yeah, communications. Yeah, I mean, people who've seen them talk about it. Yeah. yeah. So bin Laden was corresponding with a lot of people while he was in Abdabad, as you know, including with senior members of al-Qaeda. Mm. And there was, a seri there was a courier system of cutouts. One of the reasons, as you know, it took so long to find him. It took the United States arguably half a trillion dollars in terms of <laughs> our efforts uh, on, on the intelligence uh, side after 9-11 to, even though we really wanted to find him, uh, to, to kind of get into this courier system and understand it. So this courier system was pretty good. So you can imagine letters going to not only, and I think people within Al-Qaeda didn't know where bin Laden was living. It was, they didn't need to know. Right. So I think you can, you could say this correspondence is interesting, uh, but it doesn't necessarily, it certainly doesn't prove the case because there would have been cu courier cutouts that all along the way between right. the recipients of these letters and bin Laden. The second level is, the, is, is, is a Pakistani government official who talking to a US government official who told them that Pasha, there was a conversation that you say might indicate, which is both hearsay and interpretive, right? And the third level is the desk, the Osama bin Laden desk. Well, now that seems like a, something that's real, that either exists or it doesn't exist. And I guess the question is, is why, well, first, I mean, do we know the name of the person who ran this desk? Do we have any more information about this desk? Is there anything to, that you can say about it? I'm afraid I can't say anything more. It's carefully worded in the book. Um, and was it called the Osama bin Laden desk? What was it called? Who was the? I know a bit more, but I'm afraid yeah. I can't tell you because, um, and this is very important that people know, it's extremely dangerous for the person who gave this detail, as you can imagine. There's going to be a witch hunt already. And, and I was led to this person by someone else who's a journalist. And it's extremely dangerous for that Pakistani journalist. Um, I have in my prologue a quick wrap-up of how dangerous it is for Pakistani journalists. 42, I think, have been killed in the last 10 years in the course of their work. Um, and some, as we know, Salim Shahzad, people were actually you know, detained by the ISI and killed. Um, there's a lot of Baluch journalists who've ended up dumped on, you know, killed and dumped on the roadside. So, it's, um, it's, it's dangerous for the people who helped me get that, and I don't want to say anything sure. more. Sure, no, I understood. And in fact, there is a restriction on exactly on names because of that, because of, of what, it could, what consequences could be brought. Okay, it's a, it's a huge scoop if true, and we have some of the most aggressive journalists in the world, both in Pakistan and the United States. And I guess you know the, the part of me that is very quite skeptical about this is why hasn't anybody else followed up in any meaningful way on this um, now that you've put it out there? Because typically when there's a big news story, people glom That's on. Right. And, and secondly, you know, why hasn't the newspaper, your newspaper, put it in the newspaper rather than the magazine, which is a sort of separate entity? Good question. I never offered it to them, I'd say. Um, yeah, I don't know if we've even talked about that. Now, I, I will say, though, that when the book came out, or the magazine piece, um, we, I forewarned the people who work for the New York Times in um, Pakistan. You probably know that Declan Welsh, our, Walsh, our, um, our New York Times Western co expatriate correspondent, is banned at the moment from yeah. Pakistan. He's living in London. Uh, and he's actually on book leave anyway, so he's not actually currently writing, but um, I think, our, so our reporters, our local reporters, had to really lie low because of the fear of any backlash. They didn't actually work on with me on the book, but we were very worried about their safety. So I, I, I don't know, I haven't talked yeah. to the editors as why they didn't follow up on it or write about it, but it is difficult. I mean, I'll, I'll admit, yeah. I could not get a second source to confirm this. 
Um, I tried it out on US officials who said you can go with that. You can be confident you're on the right track. But they couldn't confirm it. So, so yes, yeah, yeah, some stories you only get a one source. And perhaps we won't for, for some years. I, I believe it'll come out eventually. But it, it's a very difficult one. Because essentially, it, if for a Pakistani to confirm it, they're committing treason in the Pakistani military's eyes. Um, so you're asking someone to, to really go against his own country. That's okay. how they view it. Well, let me, let, me add, let me add some other notes of skepticism. Um, you know, I, as you know, I wrote a book about bin Laden uh, and the hunt for bin Laden. And I have discovered that there was one of the wives who was living on a compound didn't know that Osama bin Laden was living in the compound. I mean, bin Laden was l hiding from people on the compound. Now, we had satellite coverage over that compound from August of 2010 to May 2011, right? We know that he never left. Forget about leaving the compound. He never left the second or the third floor, right? So he wasn't going anywhere to meet with people. And no one was coming to meet with him. Uh, so that kind of gives me pause if there was sort of a controller or somebody that he was in touch with in the Pakistani side. The other question that you have to always ask is who benefits qui bono, right? So on the Pakistani side, as we discussed before we ha came, we had a private discussion. You know, Musharraf very, is lucky to be alive after those two very serious assassination attempts in 2003. The person who investigated those attempts was, was who? Kiani. General Kiani. So he was in charge of the very serious investigation of the Musharraf assassination attempts, which were carried out by Al Qaeda, Abu Faraj al Libi, who was the guy responsible, who was in touch with bin Laden, is now in U.S. custody as a result of that investigation. So the question is, you know, Kiani's Pasha's boss. Why would he countenance a bin Laden desk when he went to great efforts to break up this Al Qaeda ring that had tried to kill his boss, General Musharraf? And that's so that's the who. It, it's kind of like puzzling. Why would the <laughs> What's the point? And again, then on the U.S. side, you know, there probably is, there are a large number of people in the U.S. government who, you know, have very dim views of Pakistan. And the U.S. government is not a unitary, you know, there's a CIA has one view, CENTCOM has another view, NSC might have another view. So, and it's a very large group of people and lots of people who would be willing, if there was a real smoking gun, to let it out. And I guess my question is, if it exists, and we have these thousands of pages of documents, Bin Laden had no idea he'd ever be found, right? So these documents are pretty effective. Uh, I mean, they were, they were his, they're sort of Bin Laden unplugged, right? right? And so if he had a Bin Laden desk, wouldn't he have communication with them um, in some shape or form? Yeah, but it, I think it wouldn't have been written. I think it, you know, it would have been. Well, we've established that nobody's visiting the compound. And he's not leaving for at least a year that we know of, and that's, uh, that's when, when we had satellite coverage over it. Right, but I think people could visit, couldn't they? No one visited the compound. In fact, people were... People and you see neighbors saw the women go out well, um, the, 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 to the hospital and stuff. Yeah, right? well, the women, there were, there were, there were 24 people living on the compound, right? right? And so the uh, courier the, and the brother and their wives yes. came and, they, and went. They and came some of the Arab women went to the hospital. We know that as well. It very I, don't know, occasionally. It, I don't know if it was in the last Well, okay, so people year, might have visited the compound disguised as women, you're saying? Yeah, well, sometimes they saw, the, they, they knew there was an auntie. Um, but we know he had three wives there, so it could have been the three wives. But there were um, the two Pakistani women and an auntie in full black bar bur burqa who was seen going to the hospital. And, and his Yemeni wife gave birth in the hospital. So, some, so the women were going out to see doctors or whatever. Um, but you, you make some very good points. And, but let me show that for each point, there's another point. So uh, he didn't travel. But then we have this recorded intelligence briefing of 2009 where bin Laden met with Saifullah Akhtar in Kohat in 2009. And now that was in the Daily Times before the raid. I tracked it down after the raid. But um, it was an anonymously written report. I found the reporter. Um, I found the, the, leak, the person who leaked it, and it came from Pakistani, all the Pakistani intelligence agencies, civilian and military, had seen that report. It was a combined intelligence report that bin Laden was in Pakistan. So my point is, if the Pakistani intelligence know that he's meeting militant leaders and he's in Pakistan, why weren't they hunting for him harder? That is really well, is I think I don't think they wanted to find him necessarily. The second thing is, Libby, yes, they did a very hard investigation tracking down Libby, he did try and kill Musharraf, 
At the time, I totally agree with you. They, they did a very serious investigation. They found Libby, they tracked him, they got him. But he, Musharraf also writes in his book that he had, he lib, that they nearly caught Libby in Abbottabad and he had the, the use of three safe houses in Abbottabad and they raided the wrong one and he got away. You know, they raided one and he was actually in another and he escaped. And Musharraf writes about that, you know. So now, what? Why aren't they checking every house in Abbottabad? That's just when they were building. Well, this is that you. I mean, this goes to the question of competence. You, oh, don't give me that one. <laughs> well, no, but it's That's true. A, it's like you know. But yeah, the, the, I just don't buy that. And I've got a cabinet minister in my book saying, "Don't believe the armed forces. You know, our Pakistan state is more competent than anyone else would believe. You know, they." And there's another minister who, who says after the Lal, the Lal Masjid um, attack or siege, he says to, to an ISI general, every morning you have on your desk the minutes of who I met the night before and what we talked about. So don't tell me you don't know that there's weapons and militants in Lal Masjid just 100 yards from your headquarters. You know, So this, this the idea of they're incompetent, they're, they're not. They're well, look. All human beings are incompetent. I mean, well, it's a, okay, it's a good but they're also brilliant. I mean, the ISI are brilliant. Well, no, I don't well. accept the idea that they're brilliant. I mean, that, that no, because no. They're, I mean, we if they're if they're brilliant, why would they be doing this strategy that you point out, which is so self-defeating? Well, but they they think they're they're going to achieve um, through chaos what they want to achieve, which is dominance of the region. Um, I agree. I think it's a ruinous strategy, but I think they really believe in it. I, I guess one final point on the on the Bin Laden issue. Um, you know, Admiral Mullen's last official act um, after 27 visits to Pakistan was to testify before a Senate committee ver and, ver and say that the Haqqani network was uh, owned and operated by the ISI. Um, presumably he has access to all the information that uh, secret information the United States has, right? right? It's kind of strange he didn't take this opportunity to say they also were harboring bin Laden since as you know, that that was, you know, it went down pretty badly in Pakistan. That uh, that public statement. Yeah, I think I think the Haqqani Mullen was particularly angry about the Haqqani arm because he just had, and I show it in the book. You know, when, before he he said made that speech, they just had these devastating attacks in Afghanistan. There was a huge truck bomb that went into a, a, a base in Wardak. And I mean, it was it was unbelievable. They didn't kill many people, but they wounded. I think it was ninety plus or seventy plus. I'd have to check. He was more angry at the Akani network than Al Qaeda. Well, the, he just had these two devastating attacks. So there's this truck bomb that, that injured seventy plus sold American soldiers, and then they had this uh, attack. Um, you know, one of these what they call a complex attack very close to the US embassy, to the point that the ambassador had to go into a bunker for 24 hours. And, it, and the, the battle raged right in Kabul around the American embassy. And people going to the consulate got injured by mortars. Um, and they'd, they'd taken a, a, a sort of high-rise, half-built construction site and, and rained rockets down on the embassy. So those two, and they, I think by then, you know, they were they were tracking Badruddin Haqqani's phone for, for ages. And, and so I think they heard him directing the attacks. They knew he's calling from Waziristan. They know he's closely in contact. I mean, they knew Badruddin Haqqani was meeting with ISI officials. So, so I think Mullen's anger was because the proof was so clear. I think, um, you know, I don't know what Mullen knows about uh, Obama, but I've had some very senior military people write to me after my story saying, you know, congratulating me and saying you're on the right track. So I, I think there are some, I don't know what they know, yeah. but I, I, I don't think just because he didn't address the Obama issue doesn't know, mean he knows things. I, I yeah. just think he had, he had very, very clear evidence that made him particularly disappointed and angry about the Haqqanis. Uh, because it was directly affecting American lives in Afghanistan. And, and what kind of ally is that that's, that's doing these things? Right. Well, what kind of ally would harbor the mastermind of 9-11? You know, and, yeah. um, you know, I, because that was obviously when I reported my book, I talked on the record to Admiral Mullen, Mike Leiter, who ran the National Counterterrorism Center, Hillary Clinton, who was Secretary of State at the time, uh, General Cartwright, who was the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Michelle Flournoy, who was Head of Policy at DOD, Mike Vickers, who was in charge of special operations, 
uh, Tony Blinken, who's now the Deputy National Security Advisor, Dennis McDonough, who's now the, the National Security Advisor, uh, the uh, Chief of Staff. Uh, the list goes on and on. And uh, this was the first question you know, I had. It's like, mm. did, was Pakistan cognizant of bin Laden being there? And this was a huge debate that they had at the NSC. They had five meetings. Um, and you know, that all these people, I mean, it's not like they are, some of them are not fans of Pakistan. They all universally said they did not know. Cameron Munter, who was ambassador at the time. Well, yeah, but so what, why he, d he doesn't know anything. I mean, I, I would go to his off-the-record briefings, and I would have to tell, I knew more he than he did. I mean, so, so some of them, I think, are sitting in You're Washington. You're saying that the head of the, the, the... The ambassador of Pakistan, I knew more than he did, no, that's I'm not, for sure. I'm, uh, that yeah. may well be the case, but yeah. I'm asking about... Is, you, you're saying that you know more than the CIA, the National Counterterrorism no. Center, CENTCOM, DOD, the NSC, the White House? Well, I'll say that, that one senior official who I did try out this, uh, this desk, special desk on, um, you know, was amazed because he said, We'd, we haven't got that. But he said it makes sense. He said you I should guess go that's with a it. it. It makes sense. It feels like for a lot of people that it, it's something they want to believe, but that's theology. No, but I, that's I not think, evidence. I think not, they can't necessarily get it. You know, what Pakistani is going to say to an American that, reveal that. You know, it, it, it came to me differently. It, the, you know, it's someone who's, who's cooperating with a longtime Pakistani source. Um, so, you know, um, the persu and persuading to let me have it is, is different to giving it to a, Pakistan, to, an, to a CIA official. So I think there is a difference in motivation of telling a journalist, telling a Pakistani journalist first, um, than telling a CIA official. Okay. But I think also, um, let's see, it'll, you know, I'm sure it'll come out. I really, you know, I really do believe this. But I, I do not trust all, all the officials because I think, I was horrified to hear that uh, a, a security, a national security um, aide in the Bush administration said they used to sit around for ages, and this was 2006, discussing is Pakistan supporting the Taliban or not. And that shocked me so yeah. much. Are they still discussing it? When, you know, 2003, 2002, it was clear. Um, I, I talked to an, uh, an American ambassador and I asked about I was getting this, this, these stories from these Taliban who were being forced to go back and fight or told they would be imprisoned or even worse, they were threatened to be killed. And I, I asked an American ambassador and I was told, oh, I've never heard anything like that. And I thought, are you stupid or you're not, you're not doing your job or are you lying to me? I mean, it, but that's there's a, sort of there's a level, argument. no, but there's, there's really <coughs> a level that is serious and I think sometimes it's, it's lying. Sometimes it's just not wanting to say on record something to a journalist that is just too sensitive. But sometimes I think there's, there's the head in the sand. I, and, and, um, but, but actually what I really do want to say, and as is, is again I mentioned it in the book, we shouldn't e spend all our time debating the toss on this. Do you believe it, do you not? Because actually what, and, and I have a, a, a diplomat saying, we shouldn't have spent years and years saying, are the Pakistanis supporting the Taliban or not? We should have actually said, this is happening. This is what it looks like on the ground. What is our policy? And I think the same with this. Because I believe Zawahiri is still in Pakistan. I know he is, actually. Uh, um, and I actually had quite a recent, very interesting tip that, that he was in Baluchistan. Um, and so it's more not who's hiding him and why, but it, it's more what do we do about it? Yeah. And that's, I think, um, I think that's really the main issue that we should be we're looking at. Okay. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand and uh, identify yourself and wait for the microphone. Where is the microphone? Start with that gentleman there. Tyler. Good, uh, good afternoon. It was very stimulating conversation. I was in, a, in Pakistan as a journalist as the Soviets were attacking Afghanistan. Uh -huh. And even uh, during that time, uh, the Arabs were coming to the soil of Pakistan and they were sent, uh, getting equipped and going to Konar and Jalalabad province. And they did lots of atrocities there that I, I, and I'm an eyewitness to that. However, uh, the bureaucracy from the United States and the bureaucracy of Pakistan didn't want to admit anything 
which is happening, happening beyond ordinary. At that time, uh, Mr. Oakley was the ambassador of the United States to Pakistan, and the, all these atrocities were getting, were happening in the soil of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. At that time, this whole movement or of, of fundamentalism was not that strong. It could be controlled, but nothing happened. Okay, we're going to have to have a question because sure. we have 15 minutes. But my question is now, it's going beyond the point that's only the threat of Taliban. With the new generation of the military in Pakistan and uh, ISI, there is, uh, do you think there is going to be a nuclear threat by the terrorists from the Pakistani soil towards the entire world? doesn't bear thinking. I don't think so. I mean, I, I still, when you work in Pakistan and you, you um, interview the military, you, there is a great sense of responsibility um, and, and a great pride um, about their nuclear arsenal. Um, it's, it's untouchable. Journalists are not allowed to write about it much and certainly not about allowed to criticize it or, or look deeply at the proliferation problems under A.Q. Khan. But I do think at the same time there is a responsibility there. And so um, although I'm very critical of the, the use of proxy war as a, as a, a, a tactic um, in Afghanistan and, Puk and, and Kashmir, I think, um, and I ho perhaps it's wishful thinking, but I think the, the Pakistani military um, has um, has has a sense of responsibility on on keeping its nuclear arsenal um, independent and untouched. They don't want interference from foreigners, but I think um, as the ultimate deterrent, um, and they 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 will guard that jealously. But I think, and I hope, uh, uh, sensibly. This lady here. Hi, my name is Ann Rutherford, and um, at the end of Lone Survivor, it was noted that the uh, Pashtun, the Afghani, protected the American because he was a guest. And this was also said of the Taliban, that they protected the Al-Qaeda because they were a guest. If we had known more about the people and dealt with them as a people, things would have been different. And do you think that they have figured out more about the Afghans as a people and to to help them and to deal with the, the insurgency. You mean Al-Qaeda have? Or so who, who's they have worked out? Oh, the, the oh you mean Afghans. the Americans? Af yeah, yeah, have the Americans. Have learned. Americans worked out? Well, certainly you can't, you can't spend more than a decade um, in a country and fighting um, and not learn something. So, um, of course, what's impressive is that um, I think the American military has learned a great deal over the war, over the both wars, the Iraq and, and Afghanistan. So they, they fight better, cle more cleverly. They they did you know they worked out the whole uh, revamp the counterinsurgency strategy under Petraeus, and you you get a lot of linguists and and, and then amazingly you see these anthropologists going alongside the soldiers into villages, uh, advising on cultural issues. Um, so th there's been a great deal of learning, but at the same time you see how poles apart um, people are in the handling of Karzai, um, in, um, you know, in also the, the, there's an attitude that Afghans can't be trusted or they all lie or you can't believe them. I, I still get that a lot. Even when I use Afghan sources and people seem to think that they're only worth half of what an American source will be. Um, so there's, there's still huge cultural differences and huge um, uh, lacks, and I'm, I'm sure I'm guilty of it as anyone. Um, but I, I think there has been a learning curve, and I think there has been great trust built. Um, you see it in some levels um, with the American soldiers and the Afghan army. You know, you see you see them working together like I've never seen before, which is impressive. Do you think the BSA will be signed in September? Yeah, maybe even July. Okay, that would be great. Yes, gentlemen. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Mohsin Kamala. I work in a law firm here. My question is from you, madam. Yeah. You said that uh, Pakistan 
they might be protecting or they knew where Iman al Zawar is in Pakistan, but I want to ask from you, what do you think Pakistan is thinking by keeping Iman al Zawari there? What do you think Iman al Zawari has some kind of bargaining value for anything? Like with the end game in Afghanistan, like Pakistan can negotiate something with US or Afghanistan and Iman al Zawari on one side, and so on the other side, Pakistan army is battling against Al Qaeda and Taliban's, and they're dying every day. So yeah. the, what sense do you make out of it, if at all? Yeah, is there? I, I'm still wondering that. But the two best um, minds that I, I, or sources that I had on this, gave their explanations. Ziadin Butt, who was a former ISI chief, he's accused Musharraf of hiding bin Laden in 2004. Um, and he, he said he did it to, um, really, to as part of his overall aim that Musharraf had, which was to cooperate with the West, uh, get the, the financial and the military assistance that he needed, and um, prevent, you know, he was given this ultimatum that originally, you're with us or against us. So he wanted to be with the West. He wanted to cooperate. He did cooperate on some of arresting some Al-Qaeda people. But he kept bin Laden for a rainy day. Uh, in other words, keep keep the financial systems coming, we'll cooperate, but you know, we'll keep this guy here, so one day maybe we need to give him up, or we control him at least, so it's sort of protective custody. So that's one theory. The other one that was given to me by a, a senior CIA American official um, was he thought that both Kiani and Pasha, because um, by this time Musharraf was out of the picture, um, just could never give up Bin Laden because he was this this symbolic figurehead to uh, the Arab world and to the Muslim world, and that they did not want to be members of a very big, important Muslim nation to be the ones that betrayed such a man and to give him up to America, so that they uh, they just couldn't do that and didn't want to be the people who did that, and and that. Um, that also makes sense. So I think those are two very thoughtful um, ideas on why they did it. Um, and I think it could be a bit of both. But these are theories. They're not facts. Yeah, they're just, but they're people even <coughs> more steeped in it than me as to why, what the motivations were. Yeah, yeah I've, I've got two brief questions. Um, I spent 11 months last year in Pakistan, based in Lahore. I was chief of party for the environmental and social assessment of Kurumtangi multi-purpose project in North Waziristan. And we did a lot of household surveys, satellite imagery work. My, my two questions are, um, why would one any, anyone really think that apart from the Durand line, the FATA, federally administrative tribal areas, are, are anything, you know, functionally p part of Pakistan, because our impression was that they're not. And the other is, do you really think the ISI military intelligence and the political parties actually share information? because our, our impression was they don't. They're like, f for us, they were completely separate entities yeah, that right. they're sort of like symbiotic organisms that don't parasitize or kill each other, but they sort of coexist. Thank you. Well, I'll buy your Great. book, by the way. Thank you so much, that's very kind. <laughs> We've got seven minutes left, so we're going to have to... The, those are great questions. I think FATA is, um, it is part of Pakistan in that I think the Durand line should be recognized uh, eventually um, by, uh, the, by the Afghans to resolve part of this problem. But I agree, it's, uh, it's very cut off. It's lived under a, s a strange code for so long since the British. And so the British created it as a, as a buffer region. And I think, unfortunately, it's still like that. And, and the tragedy is that there's one million Pashtuns who've left Fata and who are now camped in the old Afghan refugee camps and in Peshawar because of, because of this reign of terror and this, this fighting, which is just so horrendous. Um, uh, and I think you're absolutely right on, on the military and the intelligence being so separate from the politicians. And what's shocking is when you talk to the politicians, how little they understand or know about 
the Taliban, about everything that's going on, because they're really kept out of it, and, and parliamentarians are too, which is partly why I wrote the book. I really did want to start a debate inside Pakistan on this, because many Pakistanis are ignorant of what their own military and their own intelligence services are actually doing. This lady over here. Yeah, yeah, Sarah. Ah, Sarah. Sarah Chase from uh, Carnegie Endowment. I want to try to um, uh, spin a thread that might go back to the final point you made, uh, Carlotta, about policy. So, Peter, you suggest that a lot of the people you talk to have negative views of Pakistan. When you name them, I'm not sure it actually comes out that way. So I guess the question I'm trying to ask is, is it possible that Carlotta's thesis is so gigantic it would imply such a gigantic overhaul and re-examination of US policy that there's almost a, an intellectual blockage against thinking about it or even against asking some of the questions that Carlotta's asking. And the, the point that I'll just make to, to uh, as not evidence but as an indication is the famous photo, you know, with the whole cabinet. Um, and the bin Laden raid. And we all heard that President Obama uh, actually thought through whether there ought, how many helicopters ought to be going on this raid. Now, you look at the building and you look at the way it was situated and where it was situated. On the face of it, it looks like a safe house. So my question has been for a while, why was President Obama focusing on the tactical details of how many helicopters ought to go to that thing, rather than saying, golly, if this is what it looks like it is, we have a gigantic rethink of Pakistan policy that we ought to be doing. So I just ask both of you to reflect on that. Well, he didn't want his presidency to go down because there weren't enough hel helicopters. I mean, I think it was pretty simple. That's why he was interested in the tactical. But, but Yeah. Right, but if, if he really believed that they knew, but they, I mean, look, I mean, I, I just gave you um, maybe a half a dozen people. I talked to, as you know, Sarah, very well. I talked to many, many more people on the record and some on background. They all, univer none of them, absolutely none of them said we have any evidence to believe that the Pakistanis knew. Now, they could all be wrong, but the, the problem with that is that would involve a conspiracy of people all over the U.S. government all saying, hey, you know, we, we don't believe this or we, we don't have any evidence. And I don't believe that. The American government is too big, too massive to get its act together in such a way. When conspiracies happen, they come out. We live in an open society. So if there is this information within the national, I, I have no brief either way. I mean, I'm as interested as you are. Uh, but so far, there's no evidence. There is somebody, there is one person who's told Carlotta about this desk. That isn't evidence. Yeah, but I think, your, I think your use of evidence is wrong because this is, this is a secret. This is a, a covert thing. This well, is Watergate a was a thing. secret too. Yeah, but, but if we were in a court of law, we, would not, we wouldn't necessarily matter if we don't have the evidence, but we would, we would pl put all these things together and, and persuade a jury, and here we all are. Yeah, but a jury would, would acquit if it wasn't actual. It was a, you know, but it, they, it, would, they would understand the circumstances. They would understand the overall... Um, Accumulation. I of don't think evidence. we're disagreeing that there is no evidence. No. Um, yeah. Anyway, right. I, I quite agree with you that Obama um, should have done a rethink, but he actually did, didn't he? When he came into office, he, he, you know, he spoke so convincingly that this was the right war, that this was the thing we should concentrate. He, he. He really, he, you know, that Woodward book that exposed so much of what they knew about Pakistan and what was, um, was going on meant that, in my view, he did rethink it or he did look at it in a, in a refreshingly uh, clear way. Um, but what's amazing since the Obama raid, um, so, so, sorry, since the bin Laden raid, was that we've gone back. It seemed to expose everything, but actually we've gone back to this treading on eggshells as one uh, person mentions it to me in the book, um, of, of not doing anything to rock the relationship and that above all the relationship with Pakistan uh, should be continued and therefore, you know, engagement and, and careful handling and not rock the boat. And that does seem to be a, me a missed opportunity because uh, 
um, you know, in my view that it's this sort of thing that will rock and change things in the end. And uh, isn't that what we're waiting for? Um, Gentleman over here. Just a small, a small note, you know, Obama has visited dozens of countries. He's made a point of not visiting Pakistan. The idea that we have this great relationship with them that we're trying to preserve doesn't make it. I, I no, but I think, I mean, what I mean is the security, the CIA, ISI relationship. That's what the concern is to, to, to hold that together. And I think those guys um, and the diplomats around them are, are being listened to and, and are driving it. Uh, I'm Ahmed Mejidir, uh, a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, my question is related to what Sarah said. Yes, perhaps there is no solid evidence about Pakistan's complicity in hiding bin Laden, uh, but there has been uh, enough evidence uh, about supporting other terrorist groups like the Haqqani Network, which uh, has killed more American soldiers in, in Afghanistan than Al-Qaeda has. So why has that not uh, brought any major change in U.S. policy over the past 13 years. Yes. And second question that I have is completely a separate one. When we talk about the issue of extremism or terrorism emanating from Pakistan, uh, we usually just confine that discussion to Waziristan. Uh, for good reason, there are a lot of different uh, dangerous terrorist groups there. Uh, but if you see the population of the seven tribal agencies, perhaps it's uh, four to five million. Uh, making 2 to 3 percent of the uh, country's population. Uh, we usually don't talk about just other growing trends of radicalization and extremism in most more populous places like Punjab and Karachi. Mm. So do you see that in, in are these trends ha really happening? Do you see a, a more uh, uh, dangerous threat uh, on the rising emanating from Pakistan facing the Western national security interests? Thank you. Yes, very good question. And I do come to it in the last chapter of the book. I, I am actually extremely worried about that because uh, when you live in Pakistan and, and, and you, know, um, you know people, you, you, you hear all these stories of the radicalization in Punjab. People like Saifullah Akhtar, this, this really notorious character who's, who's, who's been very close to the ISI all his life, He's building another big madrasa in P southern Punjab. Um, he's still free. He's, you know, he's done, he, he, he's, he was behind the huge bombing that nearly killed Benazir when she first came back in Karachi. I mean, why, why are these guys still are allowed to carry on? And he's, so he's now indoctrinating and cha you know, encouraging uh, more P Punjabi villagers. And you know, the latest story that Kathy Gatton wrote in Punjab, who she's a, you know, a veteran reporter there, is that they're all talking about the next, the next great offensive is in Afghanistan post-2014. They're all gearing up for that. You, you hear of they're moving into Sindh, which is just unheard of in, you know, five, ten years ago. So, um, yes, it's very worrying because it's a huge country and a country I love, Pakistan. Um, and it's very, very worrying that this is continuing unchecked. And we're back to the policy thing that... that you can't walk away from, from Afghanistan. You pull out the troops this year, maybe, but you, if you walk away, uh, this, this juggernaut is continuing, and it's not stopping. You know, how, how, how many thousands of, of, of Pakistanis have gone to fight in Syria, and they've taken the polio virus with them? I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really, uh, um, it's, a, it's a very alarming, and I'm very worried for Afghanistan, but I'm very worried for Pakistan, because it's, you, you can't just, Turn off the tap. It's 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 got to be a massive policy change in both in all those countries. We have run out of time, and I presumably people want to buy your book and have it signed by you. I know you've got a oh, tight oh schedule. Nice. Thank you. And we have a lot more questions, but that's uh, uh, because there's so many good questions to ask. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>